please stand and join me in the reading of God's word. You may read in your pew Bibles or follow along on the screen. The scripture for today's reading is Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. The word of God for the people of God. And the people of God said, thanks be to God. Thank you, Bob. You may be seated. Well, it's great to see you, and I said that once, but I'll say it again. And if you're visiting today, we're delighted you're here. And um, my goal is to always try to treat you so many ways you'll like one or two and maybe come back, try us again. <coughs> and, uh, and we work on that. We're going to continue the theme that we talked about last week around the scripture of Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. And, uh, and to help kind of set that, <clears throat> what I want to focus on today, I just want to talk about, um, you know, my kids. We've raised, I think, three terrific kids. And <clears throat> I, uh, somewhere I had a picture of the three of them together at a rare moment. But this is one of those pictures of the whole clan. And, uh, and so we're sort of in that stage of life that, now uh, we're helping them raise their kids, and we've got six grandkids. This picture only shows five of them. Maisie are only. It's just an expression of her state, state and position, status in the family. She's not even in the picture. And uh, God bless her, the only daughter, granddaughter we've got. But uh, <coughs> So Sarah, I think I told you, Sarah's expecting, so we're hoping that'll be a baby girl. And uh, by the way, the Hokers are here, Amber and John. They're almost the newest parents in the, in the congregation. They have a new daughter, Stella. And so congratulations, guys. I know Peggy's excited because Jackie and Keystone, Jackie had the baby <coughs> when it was last week week and a half ago. What did they name the baby again? Uh, a baby girl, Hunter Grace. So, Hunter Grace. So, what are you going to call her? Are you going to call her H.G.? Grace? Gracie? Sweetheart? You'll figure that out. What are they going to call you? Nana and Pops. Okay. Those are original. <clears throat> so we're sort of in that stage of life when we're helping the kids, uh, you know, raise grandkids. And, and, you know, you remember back to those days you're raising your kids. And one of the things that we want, I mean, and I hope that this is a priority for you, it was for us, is we wanted them to love God like we loved God. And it was always a delicate thing because we didn't want to force them into that because then they get resentful and then they move away from it. You know what I'm saying? Some of y'all are not responding. Like one or two of you are saying, yeah, you understand. So it concerns me about your state and status and the way you raised your kids. Maybe we need to do a series on parenting. But, you know, you, you don't want to force them into that because you want it to be their own, you know. And so... One of the ways that we went about that, you, because, you know, the, the issue is, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's just no, that it, the kids, I know John and Amber maybe have discovered this, and they have a long time ago, that they don't come with the how-to-do manual, grandkids or kids, right? There's no manual on how you do that, and we've all got to kind of figure it out, and we've got to do it together. We learn from one another, and one of the things that we tried to do was teach them to pray. And so you start with those prayers that, you know, that you always start with, like, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the, soul, pray the Lord my soul to take. And then they're all twisted up about that second part. And another 10 years of therapy, our kids or adults will get over that, you know, prayer. Uh, you know, but we teach them those prayers or the prayers before meals. 
You know, God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food, amen. The thing I liked about that prayer is they could pray that prayer and the food wouldn't get cold before they were finished. And you always had that one kid that they say, I want to pray, and then they start praying. And they pray for the fork and the spoon, for the plate and the napkin, for the trees and the flowers, for the bugs and the grasshoppers. And they pray for Nana and Pops. Is What did you say your name's going to be? Nana, Nana and Pops, and they pray for brothers, and Aunt, Aunt Susie and Uncle Bill, and, and, and then finally they get around to praying for the food, and you know, it's that crazy kid. I, I'm tempted to tell you all the prayer that, you know, we learned occasionally at, at youth camp, which went something like this. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, who eats the fastest gets the most. Amen. But that's probably not an appropriate prayer to teach your kids. But it's a great prayer, right? Throughout the Bible, and particularly in the Old Testament, Jewish parents were challenged to teach their kids a prayer, this particular prayer. It was an important prayer to the Jewish faith and to the families and to the parents, and it was called the Shema. A couple of weeks ago when we were in Jerusalem, we were staying in a hotel, and on the door uh, of our room, this is, we, you know, you can see we were on the 12th floor, right? You can't now, but you could. So there's this little box on the side, on the right side of the door, and it's called a mezuzah. And in the mezuzah is this portion of scripture that Bob read to us a moment ago in Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5, called the Shema. And Jews put that on their doorposts. And this is what a portion of it looks like in Hebrew, the first portion. And one of the things that is interesting to me, and, and you just don't get this stuff everywhere, okay? We'll give you a little value added at the New Covenant. But most people, when they talk about this, they don't point this out. Hebrew is read from right to left. And so the first word there, which is the first word of the prayer which is the word Shema it's the Hebrew word Shema and it, it means hear or listen O Israel and so the first word the last letter the first word is the Hebrew letter Ayan this is good stuff isn't it you're liking this is the, is the letter Ayan and the last word on the left is a three letter word and the last letter of that word is the Hebrew letter Dalit both of those two letters are capitalized. They're larger than the other text, and that's an unusual thing that for this to ha for this to occur there, because it's not normal in Hebrew text. And scholars think that one of the things that that means is, is that that was to encourage the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, that they were to be a witness to their trust in God to their faith in God. This prayer was a centrist prayer for them. And it was to remind them of who God was in their lives. Listen or hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the rest of that passage in Deuteronomy 6 are instructions on how they're to pray and use that prayer. And, and a couple of things they were supposed to do with the prayer is they prayed it twice a day. They prayed it when they got up of a morning. They prayed it before they went to bed of an evening. They prayed that prayer. And they were instructed to write it on their doorposts. So that little mezuzah that I showed you a picture of that was on our hotel room door, and it's on every other door in a Jewish community, is that prayer to remind them the Lord, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And so they prayed it twice a day. They put it on their doorposts. They put it on their frontlets. So I'll show you a picture here in just a minute. But they put it on their frontlets, and they prayed this prayer, and they would cover their hands with the, their eyes with their right hand to focus their attention so they could be intent on their praying to God. And so they didn't want any distractions. And so I took this picture of this man who's next to the 
western wall, what we call the wailing wall, inside. And he's praying and he's covering his eyes. And he's focusing on his prayer. There's another picture of a gentleman by the wailing wall. And he's got a prayer shawl. He's covered his head with a prayer shawl. And he's focused. And you can barely see this little thing. It looks like a knot on his forehead. You see that? That's a phylactery. In that little leather box are written the words of the Shema, the prayer. The Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. And they put it on their frontlets. They write it and they wrap it you know, around their arm. They remember that prayer. We said last week that the first word is hear or listen. And what this means is that God is speaking. They're confirming that God is speaking. And they're saying, listen, because God has got something to say. That's one of the distinctives of the Judeo-Christian faith, is it's a God-to-us religion, a God-to-us a God to us kind of faith. That's important. Most other religions of the world are an us to try to some God kind of religion. And we believe that the incarnate Jesus is an expression of this prayer, that it's a God-to-us relationship. God is wanting our focus, our involvement. The second thing the prayer affirms is that God reaches out to us, this God-to-us relationship, because God is personal. As we can know Him, we can pray to Him, is that we are the object of his affection, and the phrase here, our God. He cares about us, and he cares what we care about. And then the final affirmation is the Lord alone, it says. And this speaks to the uniqueness of the Lord Yahweh, or to us, Jesus Christ, this unique relationship that we have with the, with the Lord. He's not, he doesn't, the Lord doesn't have to worry about competition from other gods because in our worship and in our lives, we're singly focused toward God. And so to a Jew, this prayer is incredibly important. It is a centrist. It's a central confession of who they are. In the first service, one of the things that we do every Sunday is we we confess the Apostles' Creed. It's a central confession of truth that ca encapsulates all of the important elements of Christian theology and Christian doctrine. And we say that every week. We call it an affirmation of faith, right? To the Jew, the Shema was their affirmation of faith. They made their affirmation of who Jesus was in their lives. And so 1,400 years later, or excuse me, 1,400 years after Moses, in the New Testament, somebody walks up to Jesus and they ask Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus goes back to Deuteronomy 6 because as a child, one of the prayers that Jesus' family had taught him, his mom and dad, Mary and Joseph, would have been this prayer. And so Jesus quotes these two verses. And he responds to the question by quoting the Shema. He quotes the prayer, which is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he says, this command is the first and the greatest and the most important. And so it is to us, because it was important to Jesus, it's important to us, and Jesus teaches if you really want to live life to its full, and you want to live life that's on purpose with God, then what you have to do is you have to live what's important to God, and that is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And so as I've been reflecting on this prayer, here's the question then. All that was introduction. You still with me? So here's the question. Is what does it mean to love God with all my heart? Now, when we think of heart, we think of that 
muscle and the center of our kind of body to this kind of to the left side of our chest and we think it's that muscle that pumps all of the blood to all of the organs brain kidneys liver all that and that keeps us alive and physiologically that is the correct answer that's what that physiologically that organ in our body does the heart but to a Jew and the meaning in the Old Testament was that the heart was the essence of who a person was the heart was the center of your life. It was an expression of your intellect, your emotions, your physical body, your will, your intent, the total sum of all of who you are, everything, your spirit and your spirituality, the essence of you is contained in what they understood. The sum of you was contained in what they understood to be the heart. And so when you're saying, I love the Lord with all my heart, what you're really saying is this. I love the Lord with everything I am, with the deepest part, the will, the intent, the center of me. I'm loving God with that, from that center. And so one of the questions as you think about this, sort of you come to is this, or that I did, thinking, well, what story in the New Testament expresses this kind of understanding of heart? And so what I focused on was John 12. John chapter 12 in the, in the New Testament. And these words are going to be on the screen. Let me, let me read you the first couple of verses of John 12. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Mary served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Now, here's sort of the setting. Bethany is, in the New Testament story, Bethany is about two miles outside of Jerusalem east up the Mount of Olives, okay? And in the story at Bethany were some friends of Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And if you read enough of the New Testament, what you understand is Jesus enjoyed hanging out with those people. They were friends of his. And so let me pause just for a teaching word here that one of the things I appreciate about the story, about the New Testament, and about Jesus is in our theology we say that Jesus is God. He's fully God and he's fully man. We say he's 100% God, he's 100% man, and that's hard to get our heads wrapped around and so some of the times I have to put those things in the category of mystery and say I don't fully understand that but I accept it I believe it because I can see the God side of Jesus I can see the human side of Jesus and so I get some glimpse of what he was like but one of the things I appreciate because sometimes we get this attitude toward Jesus that he was some kind of a spiritual religious cyborg you know he just but he was human and one of the things that Jesus needed was relationship. He needed at least and enjoyed friends. He wanted to be in relationship and he had friends. The friends were an expression of that need for intimacy in that human side of Jesus' life. And so here's a story about Jesus' friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And he hung out with those people that he liked to be with and his friends. Now, this is six days before the Passover, and the Passover is sort of like our Jewish Easter and Holy Week, okay? It's a big religious holiday, and we know that Jesus, where he's headed, don't we? He's, he's headed toward Calvary, the cross. We know as things unplay, uh, play out, is that's where he's going to be. And what you have to remember is what happened and, and this is one of the things I want to tell you, is what happened before John 12. Because it sets up the story in John 12, what happened before it. And if you're not much of a Bible st student, let me tell you what happened in John chapter 11. Mary and Martha's brother get sick, we don't know what of, and he's about to die, and they send word to Jesus because they've seen who Jesus is. And they send word to Jesus, we need you to come because our brother's about to die. And we know that if you come, he won't die. And Jesus doesn't come. And he dies. And he's been dead for four days. 
And then Jesus comes. And so in John chapter 11, Lazarus dies. Jesus shows up, and he's dead. Did I tell you he's dead? Not only is Lazarus dead, he is, I know this is not real pleasant stuff to talk about, but he's stinking dead. He's smelly dead. And Jesus raises him to life, and now he, he's alive. And the Bible tells us that in chapter 12, the party that's going on at Martha and Mary and Lazarus' house is in honor of who? Jesus. Now, you might kind of think that this would be kind of a proper party, kind of a high tea. But that's not my image of this party. I'm thinking this is kind of a Carnegie kind of a party, kind of an Oklahoma red dirt kind of get down kind of party, kind of a Hattonen party, kind of almost like a, maybe you could kind of think of a Super Bowl kind of a party, or maybe this week you could kind of think of a, World Cup kind of party. They're having fun. They're eating and drinking, having fun. It's sort of a Mardi Gras for Jesus because it's in his honor. And they're having this big party, and it's not just Jesus who's there, but Lazarus is there and Mary and Martha, and the disciples are there. All of them are there. And they're all together, and the truth is Lazarus is not dead anymore. He was stone cold dead. He was wrapped up in linen kind of dead he was four days stinking kind of dead and now Lazarus is alive that would be the kind of party I would want to go to wouldn't you I think if I was at that party and Lazarus was there I'd probably walk up to him and say could I shake your hand and I'd probably touch him, just, you know, just, and maybe just check and see if he's breathing. I mean, this is one of those huge things that's happened, these miracles in the New Testament, and the party's happening. And so here's the question is how do we respond to Jesus? the one who makes dead people come alive. How do you respond to Jesus, the one who makes dead people come alive? Because you see in the story, there's two main characters that I'm going to talk about this morning. There's two main characters, and there's two responses. And they give us insight. And so one of the things that I want us to think about as we think about these two characters and their response this morning is the question that's going to guide us through looking at these two questions is what is the condition of my heart in this worship service today, this morning? It doesn't do any good to study this stuff if we don't apply it to our own lives. And so what is the condition of my heart this morning here because we don't want to go through worship and it just be a perfunctory process and we check that off our list is we want this to be meaningful to everyone that's here and so I want to look at the rest of the story and I want us to, act, to, to answer two simple questions this morning and I want to encourage you to be honest with yourself and honest with God as honest as you can be and here's the first question. Is my heart filled with gratitude this morning? Is my heart filled with gratitude? And so let's go back and look at the story. There's a dinner party in honor of Jesus. Mary, Martha, and, and Lazarus are there. The 12 disciples, disciples are there. And Martha, she's in the story, and she's doing all the chores. And I think she's, she's doing the cooking and the cleaning up, and I think she's got a smile on her face. And this is really another sermon. But I think underneath the smile, she's thinking, I can't believe my little sister. Why can't she help me? And then there's Mary. And where is Mary in the story? Mary's at the feet of Jesus. And she's sitting with the honored guest, 
And you see in the next verses, let me read it to you. Here's her response. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with a fragrance. Now, in the first century, when they ate, they ate at a low table, you remember, and so they would have their heads toward the table. They would be, one arm would be down on a pillow. Their feet would be away, and the women were on the other side of the table. She was further away from Jesus, and so she would have had to have gotten up, and his feet were away from the table. She got up, went around the table, and she took out this jar of very expensive perfume, and she began to anoint his feet and then wipe his feet with her hair. And what you need to know that it says here that that expensive ointment was worth about 300 denarii. A denarii was a form of currency, and so what does that mean? 300 denarii is worth about one year's wage. It says that in the scripture that I read to you a moment ago. So imagine you're taking your annual salary and you're pouring it out before Jesus. In essence, you're not holding anything back. And scholars tell us that they would take these perfumes, people would invest, they would buy them as an investment because they tended to escalate in price and in value. And so this poor peasant woman took everything she had and she gave it to the one that she understood who was going to give everything, right? She poured it on his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And I want you to know what I call that is gratitude. It's thankfulness. Why was she grateful? She was grateful because her brother was dead and now is alive. Because Jesus is in her life and she was probably dead spiritually and now she's alive and he's involved with her family. Every summer about this time, for 40-something years, ever since Beverly and I were dating, <laughs> pretty much, we'd go to Minnesota to the farm. And her mom and dad ran a dairy up there. And we'd go up and spend a few days at the dairy. And when we were up there, we'd go to church with her folks. Now, her dad grew up on the south side of Chicago, down on Cicero. And it was kind of a rough place and he was a tough guy and and uh, he was adopted and so his adoptive dad died and his mother remarried and so he had a stepdad and an adopted dad and then his mother died and his stepdad married remarried and then he had an adopt uh, a stepmother so he had a stepfather and a stepmother that had really no um, emotional connection much to him and so when he became a teenager, uh, and he was always gracious when he talked about this, uh, it was strongly encouraged that he go to Minnesota from Chicago. And so during the Depression, as a teenager, he went to Minnesota and worked on farms as a laborer, and his wage was this. It was simply this, is that he worked all day, and he got a place to sleep and three meals to eat. That was it. And in the course of working in Minnesota on a farm, he met a guy that he worked with, another guy that was working, who was a relative of Bev's. He, Clarence wasn't in the family then, uh, named George Steen. And George used to tell Clarence about this discovery he made. And just as they worked together, I believe, as I remember Clarence telling me the story, that over a couple of year period of he and George working together, Clarence was telling George about what Jesus had done in his life, George's life. And, um, and I think Clarence had the intention, as he's told me, that he really thought he needed to accept Jesus, but he would kind of decided he was going to go back to Chicago one more time to kind of have a different kind of party. And he said he just couldn't stand it. And he, he gave his life to Christ. Went to the church and 
one night and fell in a heap at the altar and gave his life to Jesus, and it changed everything. Changed his worldview, changed his attitude, changed his heart. Uh, Jesus could have done a little bit more in him toward his son-in-law, but uh, that's another sermon too. But it, it really changed his heart. And so we'd go to church with them. Now here's the deal. I told you all that just to tell you just a few simple things. Is that when Clarence sang, he had no musical singing ability. He could not carry a tune. And his voice was... So when he sang, Amazing Grace, I mean, he couldn't keep the tune. You know, he just... And it, I think it really embarrassed Bev's mom. I mean, she'd look at him and... And, uh, and he just kept singing. Here's the thing. His singing wasn't pretty. But below, below what you heard was a beauty. Below what you heard was a beauty. Because it didn't matter what it sounded like. He was expressing something that came from the center of the essence of who he was. And he was not concerned about what you thought about what it sounded like. He was not there to impress. He was there to express to the God who saved his life the appreciation, the gratitude, the thanksgiving that this God of heaven has changed this old dairy farmer's life and has made the ultimate difference. He was expressing the gratitude to Jesus for making him alive. Let me remind, it reminds me, let me remind you that our purpose here is to express a grateful heart for what Jesus has done in us. It reminds me of the old hymn that I, when I worship, I want to get lost in wonder, love, and praise to the divine love, Jesus, because I was dead and he brought me back to life. And so let me ask you the question. Is your heart filled with gratitude? Not only is Jesus in this house, but there's probably a whole bunch of Lazaruses in this house. I know a lot of you were dead. Jesus made you alive. When I said that phrase in the first service, they broke out into applause because they knew that they'd been Lazaruses. Do any of you know that today? Is there any applause of gratitude in your heart? Amen. Amen. And maybe some of you this morning... You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. And today might be that day when you begin that journey, and that's good. But if you're a Christ follower today, I want you to be honest with yourself. Is your heart in this moment filled with gratitude? Or is it more like the second character in the story? And let's finish this up. The second character in the story is Judas. Judas's heart is not filled with gratitude. It's filled with selfishness. He has become very self-focused. And so here's the second question. Is my heart filled with selfishness? Now remember what's happened in the scene. The room is filled with this fragrant odor of this perfume. I mean, just fill the whole... That's what gratitude does, doesn't it? It fills the whole space and you're sucked, you smell it, it's, it's poured out on Jesus' feet, and it fills the room. And you would think that everybody in the room who knew why the party was happening because of the honored guests would join in the worship. But 
now that leads me to the final part of the story. It says in verses 4, 5, and 6, But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor. He was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. So the question is, who is Judas? Judas was a political zealot who kept pushing Jesus not to develop a spiritual kingdom but to develop an earthly kingdom. Judas had seen all the things that Jesus had done, walking on the water, raising the dead, healing the blind and the lame, and he knew, or Judas knew that Jesus could overturn the Roman government and establish the beauty of David's throne once again in Israel. And Jesus refused. Because that's not what Jesus was about. And if you remember six chapters prior to chapter 12, in chapter 6, Jesus reminds him, he tells him, one of you is going to betray me, he says. They didn't know who it was. G Judas may not have known it was going to be him. But we're back to chapter 12, and Judas is impatient. He's pushing hard. He's a pragmatist. He looks at this woman, Mary. She's spilt this important this expensive perfume on Jesus feet and he says it's a waste and we know that he didn't care for the poor it's a sham his whole attitude's a sham he didn't care about Jesus's kingdom all he cared about all Judas cared about was himself his agenda his priority what was important to him and so that's us sometimes isn't it? Sometimes we don't have any room in our hearts for Jesus because it's all focused on what we want, all focused on our agenda. So just for a moment, go back to chapter 11, the story of Lazarus. He's dead. Remember the story. Jesus comes to the tomb of Lazarus, and there's a stone in front, and he says, roll away the stone. That's another story. But do you remember Martha? She's the one that worries about everything and whether it's in order or not. She's a neat freak. And in the King James Version, it says it the best. And it says, Martha says, Lord, he's been dead for three days. He stinketh, she says. He stinketh. Now, let's, if we connect 11 to 12, just like dead men stink, so do dead hearts. Mary offered a grateful worship because of what Jesus was in her life and what he did, and the aroma filled the house, and Judas offered selfish worship, and it was a nauseating stink. And so which, which are you today? I can tell you the truth that a lot of times I'm both. I'm so grateful for what Jesus did in my life, for all that he's given me, the kids and the grandkids, and a terrific place to spend my life with you right here. And all the things that he's blessed us with. And, and I, my response is one of gratitude, but, but every once in a while, the margins get narrowed and pulled in and, the agenda of Jesus becomes the, the agenda of AC and the focus on AC. And, and so what I've learned is this, is I've got to incline my heart toward God. I've got to incline my heart toward God. I've got to tell my heart, heart, love the Lord your God. That's the words of the Shema. The prayer is telling us, listen, O heart. The Lord, your God, the Lord alone, you will love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. And let me, did I tell you that is not a suggestion? What did the person say to Jesus? What's the greatest what? Command. Heart, you will not follow the other gods of this world. You'll not follow the gods of prominence and prestige and power, which is all the gods of this earth. You'll follow the one true God. And so I want to invite you to do this with me as we close. 
I want you to stand. Yeah, stand. And I want us to pray. I've kind of rephrased this into a confession, but I want us to pray this together. It's on the screen. And then after we pray this, I'm going to invite you to respond. We've got communion at each corner of the room, places to pray, and you respond as the Holy Spirit leads you. Let us pray. I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Let's do it again. I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Amen. You respond as the Holy Spirit leads you.